Hooray, I'm so glad to be here. We made it. We did. We made it. I have to say, Doris, it is such an honor to share the stage with you here. I'm, I'm overwhelmed, but thank you for being here. And I know we have a lot to get to, so I'll just get started with the, right. your new book, An Unfinished Love Story. It's, it's based on you and your late husband, Dick, going through more than 300 boxes of letters and memorabilia, diaries that he had saved for 50 years. And you called this the last great adventure of your marriage. So tell us how that adventure turned into a book. Yeah, for a long time, these boxes were a pain in the ass. <laughs> because <laughs> they traveled with us everywhere. They'd be in our cellar, they'd be in an attic, they went to storage. And I had seen some of the material in the boxes, because he had saved everything. And he'd sort of been everywhere in the 60s, so it was a time capsule of the 60s. He worked for John Kennedy in the campaign. He was in the, John, it was in the JFK White House. He worked for LBJ as his chief speechwriter, and then turned later against the war, was with Senator McCarthy in New Hampshire in the New Hampshire primary, and then was with Bobby, his closest friend in public life, um, in his campaign and when he died. So as an historian, loving archives as I do, I, I just kept waiting for him to say, let's go through the archive. But he kept saying that it was so sad the way the decade had ended. Um, because of Bobby being killed and Martin Luther King and the riots in the streets and the campus violence, that he only wanted to look forward. He didn't want to look backward. Until finally, one day, he comes floating down the steps. He always made his, his appearance for breakfast very notable. In this case, he was singing, Oh, What a Beautiful Morning. And then he switched to It's Now or Never from Elvis. And then he said, It's time. It's time for us to open the boxes. And he said, If I have any wisdom to dispense, I better start dispensing now. So we made a pact that every week weekend, we'd go through the boxes, and we put them in chronological order, and we promised ourselves that we'd suspend knowledge of what was coming later, so that we could just live through the late 1950s and the 60s with Kennedy without remembering that he died. We could live through the great years of LBJ in 64 and 65 without remembering the war, and then we could live with Bobby Kennedy before he died. And what it meant really was that it gave him a sense of purpose in those last years, especially the last year when he had cancer. He just woke up every day wanting to go through the boxes. He kept saying, I wonder who's gonna be finished first, the boxes or me? And so it became a very emotional reliving for both of us of our, he was 12 years older than me, so I was there in the 60s, however, and it did become the last great adventure of our life. And then eventually, we talked about the fact that I might help him to write a book about it, but then in those last months before he died, he asked me if I would finish what he had only started to do. And so that's why it's called An Unfinished Love Story, A Personal History of the 1960s. And I'm so glad it was a hard thing to decide whether I could finish it or not. I thought I'd be too sad just having to do it without him. But then I realized my whole life I've spent trying to bring presidents who are no longer alive back to life. And this is why I've been able to bring Dick Goodwin back to life. And I keep talking about him every day, so he's clearly still here. So I'm very glad to be here with you to talk about him tonight. And I have to say, the first time we met was actually in Boston when the Briscoe Center had first acquired the collection. And I remember walking into the storage unit and it felt like walking into Alibaba's cave with all of these treasures. I mean, it's amazing what is in those boxes that are now here at the Briscoe Center, which leads me to ask, why did you put your papers with us at the Briscoe? Well, all you had to do was listen to Don, not only what he was <laughs> describing about how many papers are at the Briscoe Center, so I knew that these papers would be side by side with a lot of buddies from the 1960s, which is what you want. And then he was so persuasive. And really, in the end, it meant coming home. Obviously, Austin, Texas, LBJ was the beginning of my career as a presidential historian. So I really felt that it was the right place to be, to come home finally after all this long period of time for both Dick and me to come back to Austin. So I'm very, very glad to be here. And we are. We claim you. We claim you as an honorary Texan, absolutely. Um, now, I, we should also point out that while both you and your husband, through your work in the 1960s, had kind of front row seats to what was going on in the country and in the White House, you actually didn't meet until the 70s. And so let's start talking through the 60s, but I will point out to everyone, there's one of the really remarkable things about the book is how Doris traces these parallel experiences, your own life versus what Dick was going through. How did Dick 
get to be a part of John F. Kennedy's campaign team? How did he land that position? Well, what happened is he had gone to Washington after he had graduated from Harvard Law School, where he was first in his class, as he often told people, <laughs> an editor <laughs> of the Law Review. And yes. so he could have had any job he wanted to, really. They, floor firms were flying him all around the country um, to say, would you come to my firm? And then he could have had a clerkship, which he took with Justice Frankfurter, or it's, or it's a scholarship abroad. Um, but he somehow knew that he wanted something different than just to go into the practice of law. So it was some inchoate desire to, to be in public service. And being with Frankfurter was the beginning of that. And while he was in Washington, John Kennedy was getting ready to run for the presidency. And Ted Sorensen, the chief speechwriter, needed a second in command. And so he, he, Dick was one of those bright young things in Washington. So he asked him to work on a speech. And Dick worked on the speech. And we found the maiden speech in the boxes. It was so amazing. And as I read it aloud, Dick said, you know, that's not really great. It was kind of overly dramatic. He said, <laughs> but it, it did one thing. It got me the job. So <laughs> what happened is that he then was asked to do a second one. And that chose him as the second speech writer. He had no idea that they had asked 30 other people to do the same thing. And that it was part of a contest, which he actually happened to win. But it meant that he was there in the beginning, right? The first John Kennedy flew around during the primaries and the election in a, a small private plane. I mean, it was kind of a special private plane that Joe Kennedy was able to afford to give for them. It had fax machine and typewriters and a bed for John Kennedy and chairs for Dick and Ted and other people that would turn into beds. So it was very intimate. It was not like a big production that you'd have today. And he became part of that team. And so what we were able to uncover were what was so special about those early years of John Kennedy. And I think one of the moments that stood out the most was what became the birth of the Peace Corps. So in October of 1960, after he'd won the nomination, he was going around the country. And he was going to Michigan for a, a day-long tour. And he was just stopping at the University of Michigan to go to sleep that night in the Michigan Union. But he got there at 2 AM in the morning, and there were 10,000 kids students who'd been waiting for him the whole time. So he knew that he had to give a speech, but none had been prepared. And Dick and Ted had gone off to the cafeteria that was open for 20 to get something to eat. So he was <laughs> left alone. He started to go up to the union. And he realized, I just got to turn around. And he turned around, and he gave what people said was the longest short speech that he'd ever <laughs> given, three minutes. And he just simply asked the children who were there, the students who were there, would you be willing to go to Ghana or a place in Africa and help the people there, using your skills in literature, using your skills in an engineer, helping other countries to do what they, what we want them to know that we in America can help them to do. I think that college, he finally said, is not simply to provide an economic advantage over other people, but to give people a sense of purpose in their lives. And what happened is then he went away. And that in the next week that followed, the students there, and I interviewed the two people who were the leaders of this, they signed a petition. They got 1,000 students to sign the petition saying they'd give two years of their life to this non-existent program. He hadn't even mentioned the word Peace Corps. It was just the idea. And that got to Ted and Dick. And they wrote a new speech for John Kennedy just a couple days before the election in which he called for a Peace Corps. And it became the signature program of his administration. So there were moments like that when you saw the inspiration of John Kennedy carried out in his inaugural address that began that whole notion in the 60s that young people felt they could really make a difference. And I felt part of it again when I was going through that with him. Yeah. Yes. And Dick did go on to work very closely with the Peace Corps while he was part of the Kennedy administration. Right. And there was also the, the fun of finding the notes for the debate after we just went through this <laughs> debate between um, Trump and Harris and between Biden and Trump. Um, Dick was part of the small team that just Ted Sorensen and another guy named Mike Feldman who prepared John Kennedy for the debate. And similar to the problem that we saw with Trump and Harris, um, John Kennedy prepared enormously for that debate, day after day after day. Dick said he didn't sleep for weeks, just worrying about the debate. Finally, on the morning of the debate, he was so prepared that they had gotten everything down to five by eight cards, 100 anticipated questions, and 100 answers to it, which he was memorizing. And he was sitting on his bed, and he'd throw the cards down as he figured out each one, like a solitaire thing, goes on the floor. And he, he knew then that he had practiced enough that he could be relaxed that night. Nixon, on the other hand, was so certain that he would beat him because he had debated so much as vice president that he didn't feel he had to prepare for it. And in fact, he spent the day in seclusion while John Kennedy was going over with his friends, doing, going to, you know, and took a nap that afternoon, got up, and then and the 
CBS people said, you could come and look at the set if you want to. So Kennedy's people went, and they saw that it was a gray backdrop, so they dressed him in a blue suit so he'd look good against the gray backdrop. Nixon's people, not having gone there, he, he wore a gray suit and he melted into the background. <laughs> so it shows that preparation mattered, and I think that's what happened in some ways in, the, in, that, in that Trump bait, that first, first Trump debate with Harris, that he didn't think he had to prepare either, but it shows everything. Hard work and preparation mean everything, and, and we saw that in the terms of the Nixon candidate. The first great debate, 70 million people watched that debate, which was equivalent to almost the greatest debates we've seen today, and we had half the population then. And then Dick was so cute, it was he was on the plane that night, and he was so excited. And John Kennedy and Ted Sorensen are going over very analytically, what could we have done better? Where could we have better, a better answer? And Dick said, we won. We won the <laughs> debate. Why aren't we celebrating? Um, John Kennedy was having tomato soup and beer, which was his comforting food, an odd combination. And finally, he, finally Kennedy looks at him as a veteran, and he said, get some sleep. Tomorrow's another day. We have a long way to go. But something happened that night. The next day when he went out on the campaign trail, Hundreds of people were there. They'd been there before, but they were screaming. They were breaking down the barricades. It was weird. They'd seen him in person before, but now he was on that box of television. <laughs> so he was the first political celebrity, I think, that we've had as a presidential candidate. And you, you watched the debate as a, as a young oh, woman. Well, what Dick and I did when we were going through the papers, we had a debate date. We had a bottle of wine, and we <laughs> said we'd watch it on YouTube. And then he was teasing me, who do you think's going to win? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I knew the answer. <laughs> So what's really compelling, um, you know, you're bringing us into the workings of the White House through Dick's eyes. And as a speechwriter, he, he had a very unique way of influencing policy. And there's a passage in the book I'd like to read. Language and policy were often part and parcel of the same action, like two logs that can make a fire. So in what ways did what Dick do as a speechwriter influence the administration's policies. Yeah, I mean, he would always argue that speech writing is often just a, a tool for coming out with a policy. It's not just rhetoric that's given at a certain point in time. So for example, he worked on a speech in the Shrine Auditorium in September of 1960 during the campaign, and it was gonna be the first major speech that John Kennedy was making on civil rights. And so they decided that he would come out for a very controversial but important policy in the speech to call for an executive order that he promised to sign immediately. It later said with the stroke of a pen um, um, to end federal discrimination in public housing, in any, any housing that had federal, federal um, connections to it. And so John Kennedy gave the speech, and then it was very controversial after he won the election. They went through all the promises he had made, like 82 promises. In those days, you made promises. It mattered that you kept them. And they got to this promise on the executive order on discrimination. And Kennedy said, who the hell wrote that? And Ted Sorensen said, well, I didn't. And Dick said he never, ever was so quiet and not claiming credit for something. <laughs> he just kept quiet. And it became a, a difficult thing, and it took a while for Kennedy to do it. And finally, the civil rights community started sending ink to the presidents, to the White House. There's some ink if you needed to sign that thing. <laughs> and so finally he signed the executive order. But that shows. But it meant that because of that single speech that Dick worked on for him, he got involved in civil rights. And the favorite moment he had was in, about the of civil rights progress that was made. On the day of the inaugural parade, it was very cold outside, as some may remember. Nobody was wearing a coat because John Kennedy wasn't wearing a coat. And he couldn't wait till it was over. One parade, one parade going after another, one contingent. And finally, when it was over, Dick went into the White House to inspect his digs. He was going to see where he was going to have his office in the West Wing. And who does he find there doing the same thing but John Kennedy? So Kennedy said to him, did you see the Coast Guard contingent in the parade? and he couldn't remember anything. And he said to him, there wasn't a black face among them. I want you to do something about that. Dick was so excited. It was his first mission as a young White House aide. He ran up to his office. He didn't even know what department the Coast Guard was in. It turned out to be in the Treasury Department, not, in, as you would imagine, maybe in the Pentagon. And he called up the Secretary of the Treasury, and they put on a search, and they got the first black cadet to come into the Coast Guard. But more important, they did a number of of studies to show how many blacks were in appointments in the federal government, and out of a 1,000 lawyers in the Justice Department, there were only nine blacks, only four in foreign service with several thousand, and they started a program to get more African Americans into positions of power. So again, those little things can somehow create momentum in government. Okay. So, um, yes. <laughs> One of the, or uh, you know, 
as, as I hope all of you are able to come and see the exhibition, see these papers, and, and some of the treasures that we have are some heartfelt, beautiful notes from Jacqueline Kennedy. So tell us about Dick's relationship with the First Lady. Yeah, well, what happened is Jackie was so interested in art and literature, which Dick was as well. That was his real love in many ways, was he had always hoped that maybe he could become a writer. And it ended up being a public service writer in those early days. But he got involved with her in a series of projects. One became known as A Night in Camelot. It was one of those special dinners that sort of epitomized um, the, the whole idea of Camelot during John Kennedy's administration. And what had happened is Dick wrote Jackie a memo saying, why don't we have a dinner for the Nobel Prize winners? It will give young people a chance to think that if they work hard at something that science and, and things that produce a Nobel Prize are worthy of awards like that rather than celebrities in other fields. And so it became this very special dinner. It turned out Pulitzer Prize winners along with Nobel Prize winners. And one of the things that's in the exhibit is because it was his idea, Jackie sent him a picture of herself walking with him. She, she got to escort her to the dinner. He looks like he just won the lottery. There's this huge <laughs> picture. She looks so beautiful. There are violinists on the side, and in they go. And that was the night that John Kennedy, making his announcement that night, to welcome everybody to the dinner said, this is the most extraordinary collection of talent ever assembled in this room, the East Room, and except for the night that Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> so there were a number of other projects, but they did become very good friends. Yes. So um, turning to a, a very dark day, Kennedy's assassination, uh, Dick Goodwin was in Washington, D.C. at the time, the president, when he learned that the president had been shot. And he ended up playing a, a small but important part in bringing Kennedy's body back to the White House. Can you tell us about that day? You know, what happened is he just thought, as soon as he heard about it, he just needed to get back to the White House. And there was a small team there that were preparing for the funeral and doing whatever needed to be done. Sarge Schreiber was part of that. And Dick cut two assignments from that. One was that Jackie had sent two things that she really wanted to happen. One was an eternal flame. She had seen it in Paris and she wanted to have one put on the grave site of her husband's body so that there'd be a light there, just like a, a light that you'd keep for somebody as a little child that when they go to bed at night. And he was responsible for finding that eternal flame. He called Paris, and the generals over there said, we can't get it there at time. He said, what? You can't do that? And so they eventually just had engineers that were able to rig up you know, the old luau lamps that people had in outdoor parties. If you put propane gas underneath the grave site, and then it would turn out that you had a flicker, and she could turn it on. They were so afraid of whether it would work or not, and it worked, and everybody breathed. They got it there only hours before the body came back. But she also wanted that she wanted a private showing when he first came back to the East Room. Um, and it would only be for the family that would be seeing him and the, and the White House staff. But she wanted the East Room decorated as it had been when Lincoln was there, so that it would have an historic reference. So Dick remembered that in the cabinet room, there was Carl Sandburg's biography, and there might have been a picture there. And they found that, but they needed something more. So they had to break into the Library of Congress, which was closed, with a <laughs> flashlight, because the lights didn't go on at night. And they found a, a magazine that had an actual picture of the shrouding on the top, the catafalque, which they got a catafalque like Lincoln was there. So that when Jackie came in, and his body was in there. She came to the casket, kissed the top of the casket, but felt that it was, in a sense, an historic moment, as Lincoln's was. So I guess these people, during that terrible time, they had to have projects that kept them going. And it created a team. And I have a feeling that Dick's really close connection to the Kennedy family, in some ways, came from that night, which was such a terrible night, but they felt they were moving forward as a result. And as a part of that, that team, that close inner circle. Um, Dick was also involved in the conception of the Kennedy Library, and as we're here in the LBJ Presidential Library, it's only appropriate to ask, what was Dick's vision for the Kennedy Presidential Library? Yeah, there's a diary. Di Dick kept a diary during this period of time. I wish he'd kept it the whole time because it's so incredible, but it talks about the fact that he said in a meeting, I don't want it just to be a repository of books. It has to be alive. You want it to be a study center where people can come, and then he talked about it to me when we were discussing it, saying we want people to experience, to imagine that they could go back to the time when the library is, is representing. They can feel the person being alive in that place. And, um, and that, 
that, and that again gave the Kennedy family and the close people something to work on. I mean, it seemed incredible that they were already thinking about this days after the assassination, but I think it gave them a sense that he wouldn't really die, his legacy would live on in this library. And yeah, there was a moment I remember when Bobby Kennedy said to Dick, it's just not fair, Jack Kennedy had only three years, and, and, and will he be remembered? And Dick said, well, Julius Caesar had only three years, and he's still remembered. And then Bobby said, yes, but it helps to have Shakespeare write about you. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, the libraries create that living legacy so we can reimagine what it was like to be in that time, and it's a wonderful thing to have. And I think that obviously the model of a, of a living, vital, place. We're certainly doing that tonight with you. Well, so This is one of the, I've seen a lot of presidential libraries. This is absolutely one of the very best. It's so alive. It's so colorful. It's really wonderful. Yes, it is. So you've just shared with us how close Dick was with Kennedy, with the Kennedy inner circle. And we all know that um, JFK and LBJ there were some tensions between them. Um, you know, they weren't uh, weren't the likeliest of, of running mates. But it's fascinating to me that Dick then went to work for LBJ and became a confidant of his. So how did this Kennedy man come to work for LBJ? There really was a fault line at that point between the Kennedys and and Johnson, and I think partly Bobby Kennedy more than more even than JFK. But we finally found we we knew that obviously J, LBJ had known of Dick as because when he was vice president, Dick had worked on a couple of things for him. But the real impetus for it, we found a tape in one of the LBJ great tapes, which we listened to, which as you know that he had a, in his Oval Office he had a button he could press so that whatever promises some congressman or senator made to him, he could say, "Look, I have it here and right here." And in this case, it was a discussion in March of six. So it's only four months or so after JFK's death between Bill Moyers and LBJ. And LBJ is saying to him, I need a speechwriter here. And this is the way he talked. He, I, I need somebody who can put sex into my speeches. <laughs> I need somebody who can put great Churchillian phrases into my speeches. I need somebody who can put rhythm in my speeches. Who could that be? And Moyers, who had worked with Dick in the Peace Corps, said, well, I think the only person is Dick Goodwin, but he's not one of us. And what he meant by that was he was a Kennedy. But nonetheless, he asked Dick then, LBJ did, to work on a, a poverty message that he was sending to the Congress. And then he ended up becoming the chief speechwriter. And really, his most extraordinary contributions, I think, to, um, to our country's life came through LBJ. You mentioned the war on poverty, that being part of the Great Society. Dick had a hand in naming the Great Society. Tell us about that. This is one of my favorite stories that Dick loved to tell. So what happened is not long after he was there, in maybe April of 64, Moyers came to him one morning and said, the president wants us to come and discuss with him a Johnson program. The tax cut bill, which was Kennedy's program, had already gotten through. Civil rights bill, which was Kennedy's initiative, was about to get through. And he wanted to have a, 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 a sort of a, a way of thinking about whoever Johnson's programs were going to be, his agenda. So Dick said, are we meeting in the Oval Office? He said, no, we're going to the White House pool. Mm -hmm. So they go to the White House pool, and they find Johnson naked, swimming in the pool, up and down. Jo Dick said he looked like a big whale, going up and down, <laughs> side-stroking up and down the pool. So then Moyers and Dick are standing there with their suits and ties on on the side. And Johnson said, well, come on, guys. We've got a lot to talk about. Come on in. So they have no choice but to strip on the spot. So now you have three naked guys swimming in the pool. And finally, Johnson pulls over to the side. And he's able, as they're just hanging on to the side, to articulate everything that he wants. He knew that the first night he became president, actually. He knew he wanted to have Medicare. He knew he wanted to have federal aid to education, civil rights, voting rights, immigration reform. And then, of course, it got much bigger, and NPR and PBS and Head Start and everything. And so he, he tell them, this is what I want. This is, my, this is going to be my program. And so then he said, well, we need to have a speech. Again, to go back to your earlier question, a speech could be a way to articulate the coming out of this program. So they decided to go to the University of Michigan to give the speech on May 22nd at a commencement, which was really interesting, because that's where the birth of the Peace Corps took place. And in fact, there's a plaque on the steps at the University of Michigan to say that John Kennedy, this is where the Peace Corps was born, I'm going to, before I die, get a plaque at the University of Michigan for the Great Society speech. Because what happened yes. is, so then they decided, what's the name for this thing? And they, somebody wanted to call it a better deal rather than a new deal. <laughs> Someone else wanted a glorious society. But finally, Dick 
Friedrich started writing a bunch of small speeches for him trying out Great Society. And it was not in capital letters then, it was just Great Society. And finally, that's what caught on. So the Great Society became um, the result of three naked guys in a pool <laughs> one day. <laughs> So uh, you alluded earlier to some of Kennedy's work regarding the civil rights movement. Obviously, we can't talk about the 1960s without delving into that. And I'd like to point out in particular um, Bloody Sunday, March 7th, 1965, a group of peaceful protesters trying to gain voting rights in Alabama, led by John Lewis, were met by horrible, horrible police brutality. And that motivated Johnson to give a speech that became known as We Shall Overcome, one of the most important speeches in American history. Tell us the story of how Dick came to write that speech. You know, what had happened is that Johnson had thought that he would wait until 1966 at first for voting rights because the country needed to absorb the Civil Rights Act, and he had all the great society legislation to get through, but he understood that once that imprint of those Alabama state troopers going after the peaceful marchers who were marching from Selma to Montgomery to protest all the devices that were being used against African Americans to, to not allow them to register to vote. You had to come in only maybe one day a month, and you had to recite the 13th Amendment, the 16th Amendment. You had to say how many seeds there were in a watermelon, how many jelly beans in a jar, unanswerable questions. And as a result, in Selma, even though 55% of the citizens were blacks, only 2% were registered. So Johnson understood, once those images were captured on television, that something would happen to the conscience of the American people. And he had to channel that moment. At that time, he was able to make a pivot from what he had expected and to go for voting rights right then. So he decided on a Sunday night that he would make the speech on Monday night. Normally, for a joint session of Congress speech, you'll work on it for weeks. And Dick had only that one day from that morning at 9 in the morning until 6 at night to help write that speech. So he gets into the office, and everything was in chaos. And, and he, the night before, somebody had been there in the White House, and Dick was having dinner with Arthur Schlesinger the night before, so it had been assigned to somebody else other than Dick. So when he got in the morning that Jack Valenti was the one who did that, um, Johnson said, well, how's Dick Goodwin doing on the speech? He said, well, sir, I didn't assign it to him. Will you get him to write that speech? That's why he had only that day to do so. And at first, he put his watch away. He figured, if I put my watch away, I won't watch time passing somehow kind of crazily. And then he started to write. And he knew then, he told me, and I, all of us who are writers know, the hardest thing is to get the first line of anything, whether it's a chapter or a book or a speech. And he finally came up with a beautiful line. I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. I mean, just the rhythm of that, dignity of man and destiny of democracy. And then he went on, at times, history and fate meet at, that's why history and fate, that's why the, next, the name of the exhibit, history and fate meet at a certain time in a certain place. And then he situated Selma in history. Dick always wanted, and so did Johnson, to, to make the, the sense of where you were connect to fuller history. So it was in Lexington and Concord. So it was at Appomattox. So it was in Selma, Alabama. And then he went on to say, this is not a Negro problem, not a white problem, not a Northern problem, not a Southern problem. It is an American problem. And we are met here tonight, not as Democrats, not as Republicans, to meet that problem. And then in the middle of the day, Dick took a break to smoke his cigar and take a walk outside. <laughs> and he heard in the distance um, uh, some people singing, We Shall Overcome. So he came back in, and that came the inspiration for um, what Johnson said. And he delivered it so perfectly. He said, but even if we get the right to vote, um, we still have to overcome. The entire country has to overcome a century of bigotry and oppression. But if we come together, we shall overcome. And suddenly, the House of Representatives, the congressmen, the senators realized that this extraordinary moment had happened where the anthem for the civil rights movement that had given courage to the freedom riders and the sit-ins and the marchers against segregation had been lifted to the highest councils of power. And that's when change takes place in the country, when an outside movement meets an inside power. And they leapt to their feet. Congressmen and senators were crying. And Dick was standing in the back of the well that night. He said, God, how I loved Lyndon Johnson that night. But that wasn't the end of it. Dick, Dick was not bothered by Johnson. Much of the night, he would send out the pages. Johnson would edit them. They'd come back. But he finally called him up at one point. He said, you know, Dick, I'd like to talk about Catula. 
And Dick knew what that meant, because Johnson had told him about his experience as being a young teacher at Southwest State Teachers College, and he had to take a year off to make money, and he went to a small Mexican community in, in Catula, Texas. And he told Dick, and he had told him before, that he had seen the pain of prejudice on these kids' faces. And he couldn't do much for them. He could give part of his salary, which he did, to get sporting equipment. But he wanted to do so much more, and he couldn't. But now maybe I can, he said to Dick. And so then a passage was written that he again delivered perfectly, saying, when I was there in 1928, and I had these kids, and I couldn't help them. And I, I, I know the pain. When you see the pain of prejudice on a young kid's face, you never forget the scar that it leads. And then he said, but now, it's 1965, and now I am president of the United States, and now I have the power, and I intend to use it. It was great. It was the great moment of the speech, really. And, and, and much. And much, much, much later, somebody saw a picture of Johnson when he was teaching these kids. You see this tall bean pole and all these little kids. And the person said to him, well, who, who wrote that speech? And he said, they did. And that was right, that experience mm. in Catula. And Dick said that was probably right. That's what created that compassion and that desire which, which held Johnson the rest of his life to do something about civil rights. So you were watching. Johnson give this speech, and you were very active in the civil rights movement yourself. You went to the March on Washington, um, where Dick was as well that day, although, of course, you didn't know each other. Um, what, were, what did the civil rights movement mean for you and your love of country? What was it like for you to watch that speech? Oh, I, I was watching it with my friends, and, and just we had watched prior to that, the week before Bloody Sunday, and that night it was just so hard to believe that this was our country. It was such a sad thing to watch. And then there was a Reverend Reeb in Boston who had gone down to help the marchers and was killed by some Ku Klux Klan people, and we all marched into Boston for his argument, for his protest, his death. And then that night, when, the, when Johnson gave the speech, when it was over, and especially when that moment came of we shall overcome, because I had been, when I was a 20-year-old, I was at that march on Washington. And it was probably the moment in my life, the first time I ever felt I was part of something larger than myself. I was carrying a sign, happily, Protestants and Jews and Catholics unite for civil rights. And I was so proud to be there. And, and at the end, when we all sung we shall overcome, even more, I think, than the words of Martin Luther King, to be holding hands and, and, and singing that song together, you felt you were part of something larger. I went back to my senior year in college, and I had majored in international relations, and I'd gotten a Fulbright to go to Paris. I changed my mind. I didn't want to go away. I wanted to be in America, where I could help in what was happening in the social movements of our country. So for me, then, if I had ever imagined, when I was listening to that speech that night, that several years later, I'd be working for the president who delivered that speech, or that 10 years later, I would meet and marry the man who helped to write that speech. I could never have imagined that. <laughs> and I will say that is seeing the, the manuscript, the draft of the speech in the exhibit, I mean, it gives me goosebumps. It's, it is a relic. It is a profound and wonderful thing to see. So again, I hope you all get a chance to see it in person. It's, um, it really is a relic of American history, I think. Um, now, we, we've talked about how Dick was able to work with Johnson and channel uh, Johnson's own inner experiences into these powerful speeches. What led him to leave the Johnson White House? Well, initially, in 1965, he really had gotten a fellowship to go to Wesleyan University and to be a writer. That's what he had always dreamed of in the first place. He was afraid if he stayed too long in the government that that dream would never be realized. Johnson had other plans, however. And you, the discussion which he had with Dick about, you can't leave. You just can't leave. It's your duty. It, you're president. It's your duty. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to call up Wesleyan and say, there's no possibility of your coming to this fellowship. <laughs> and he said, do you need more money? You know, if you need more, I'll, I'll get you to do that. You know, and if you need to go away every now and then, as long as you come back and you work for me full time, it'll be OK. And then he finally says, you know, I have the power to draft people if I need to. <laughs> um, <laughs> There, there's a special law that, and, the, and he brings out That's the right. law. There's a special law that allows you somebody who has vital interest to the country's needs. You can draft them. So Dick thought he's just teasing, but he called up McNamara, and he found, and McNamara was very evasive that maybe it's true. <laughs> so finally, anyway, he did go, and he went to Wesleyan, and then later, 
um, being outside of government too, he, he banned to turn against the war. And that became a very sad thing in a way because it meant that his relationship with LBJ was, was broken and on both sides because LBJ was very angry with him when he made a speech for the first administration official against the war. And it was one of the things that was hard for us in our lives because I was always the Johnson girl. I was so loyal to Lyndon Johnson. He gave me my first experience in public service with him and it's what made me a presidential historian. And he was always defending Kennedy as I said earlier. And what was sad was that he had a sort of grievance toward Johnson and I think it was partly just the sadness of how the decade had ended. And as we went through the papers though in 64 and 65, just what we're just discussing, and he began to emotionally remember what it was like to work for Johnson in those great years. And what had happened was still there. The war had not destroyed Medicare and Medicaid and aid to education and civil rights and voting rights and Howard University. That speech he also worked on with Lyndon Johnson, affirmative action. Um, and he began to remember how close he had been to him. And it was great. One night we went to bed and he just said, oh my God, I'm feeling affection for the old guy again. <laughs> but more importantly, it meant that those grievances he'd felt, which had really festered inside of him, were, were, were undone. And in those last, all of us who knew him knew that in those last months of his life, he was more serene and fulfilled than he'd been. He knew that what he had done with Johnson would be remembered, that it mattered for the country that it would be remembered. And it, it certainly is remembered by the country now. I mean, the historians bring Johnson's rankings up little by little. There was one poll I saw not long ago that Johnson was actually eight and Kennedy was nine. How happy that would have made him. <laughs> More importantly, the boxes had such an emotional impact on us both because it brought that sense of, of peace to, 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 to Dick. All of us want to be remembered. I mean, as, as Don Carlton said earlier, we want our stories told. And somehow he had a feeling that, you know, that his story would be told because of the way we were doing the boxes and that I would finish the promise that I'd made to him before he died, that I would finish it. Um, and so it's meant a lot to me. So being back here and having this, these, these boxes alive now that people can see, there's a telegram that Martin Luther King sent after the Howard University speech in which he said it's the most profound speech ever given by any president and Johnson should be so proud of that. Yeah. Uh, now, to be fair, you also were critical of LBJ. In fact, in a very public way, right as you were starting your work in the White House. Tell us about that. The relationship with LBJ started in a very curious way. I was chosen as a White House fellow when I was a um, second year graduate student at Harvard. It's a great program, still exists today. <clears throat> you either work for the White House staff or you work for a cabinet officer. And we had a big dance at the White House the night we were selected. President Johnson did dance with me. It wasn't peculiar, there were only three women out of the 16 <laughs> White House fellows. But as he danced with me in quite dramatic fashion, he whispered that he wanted me to be assigned directly to him in the White House, so it was so exciting. However, months prior to that, like so many young people, I'd been active in the anti-Vietnam War movement, and I'd written an article with a friend of mine against Lyndon Johnson, and we had sent it to the New Republic, and we hadn't heard anything. The article was calling for a third party candidate to challenge him so that the poor people and the minorities and the women and the anti-war people could all come together in the political system, because we'd gone to a big march in Washington where violence was on the edges. People were burning draft cards, construction workers were throwing things at the marchers, and we felt like it was getting out of control. We wanted it in the political process. It was a rather political science-y, probably nerdy article. <laughs> but they decided to publish it suddenly several days after this big dance in the White House was announced, and the title they put on was How to Remove Lyndon Johnson in 1968. <laughs> so I was certain he would kick me out of the program, but more importantly, I was so afraid he could undo the entire program. It was a pretty, now it's one of those stories that's great after the fact, but at the time it was pretty scary. And I, I, I wasn't sure what would happen. I later found out when I was working on the book that there was an FBI investigation of me. And then there's a discussion of a, um, Senator Russell is in the room with, with Lyndon Johnson one night. What are we going to do about Doris Kearns? <laughs> and finally, Lyndon Johnson solved the whole quandary. He said, oh, bring her down here for a year. And if I can't win her over, no one can. So incredibly, I ended up working for him eventually in the White House. 
and then accompany him to his ranch to help him on the memoirs. And mainly, I think I was there to listen to him talk. He just loved to talk about the old days when he was the head of the NYA in Texas, when he was a young congressman for <clears throat> during FDR's New Deal. And luckily, the two chapters that I was working on on the memoirs had to do with civil rights in Congress. So he was really happy to talk about those instead of foreign policy and, civil, and, and, and the war in Vietnam. And he talked everywhere we were. When we would swim in his pool where there were floating rafts with floating phones on them and floating notepads so that you could take down his words. As we would go to a movie theater and the movie was about to start, he would be talking. And I guess I'd like to wonder why it was that he had spent so many hours talking with me. And I, I, I knew that part of it was that I was yet a young historian and I'd maybe be writing about it in the future. And I knew that a part of it was that I loved listening. He was a great storyteller, fabulous, colorful, anecdotal stories. And I know some of you know this story, but I also worried that part of it was that I was a young woman then. So I was constantly chattering to him about steady boyfriends, even when I had no <laughs> boyfriends at all. And everything was perfect. And then one day he said he wanted to discuss our relationship, which sounded ominous. And he took me to the lake, conveniently called Lake Johnson, Lake Lyndon Johnson. And he was wine and cheese, all the, all the romantic trappings. And he started out, Doris, more than any other woman I have ever known. And my heart sank. And then he said, you remind me of my mother. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was, our, our, and it was, the, it was a great, it was the greatest friendship. It was the... <laughs> Did you keep your bathing suit on in the pool? I or? certainly <laughs> kept my bathing suit on. Let I, that I be known for the record. Have it known for the record. Yes. I don't know how I swim in that pool all the time. I mean, I always worry about my hair. I must have looked terrible. <laughs> I never was look, looking in a bathing suit, but we were in that pool a lot. He loved the pool. <laughs> That's great. Uh, speaking of, uh, of Lyndon Johnson, we, we should mention his wife, Lady Bird Johnson. And I know you... Um, got to know her and uh, have some wonderful stories to share with us. Is there anything in particular you'd want us to know about Lady Bird? She was amazing. I mean, as anybody who knows, knows that she was there for him as a partner without whom I'm not sure he could have become who he became. Just able to smooth ruffled feathers if they were done. There was a moment in time in the fall of 1968, my own experience with her, um, I'd been down to the ranch, so I'd gotten to know her pretty well, and, and, and she was always there, always there, whenever I needed her as well as anybody else. And what happened is in the fall, we were starting to argue because he wanted me to come and work on the memoirs, but he wanted me to come full time. And he wanted me, he said I could live in Austin during the week and then live at the ranch on the weekend. And I really wanted to start becoming a young professor at Harvard. And I, I said to him, I'd love to work on the memoirs, but can I do it part time? I'll come down every few weekends, and I can come down in summers, and I come down on vacations. And he said, no, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Mm -hmm. And so by the time we got to December, I was there at Christmas time. He was really angry with me for not agreeing to come. And I was still sad but that I couldn't do it. And now I think about it, I would have lost everything if I hadn't come. But I was just being stubborn and thinking maybe I could have it all. And it's, he never yelled at me the way he did with other people, but he would use ice when he was angry with people, which meant instead of fire, it would be ice, which meant he'd come into a room and he wouldn't talk to me. He wouldn't look at me. He would talk to everybody else as if I weren't there. Mm. And I remember Lady Bird saw that. And because the next, all of a sudden, the next day, suddenly he said, let's go swimming in the pool. And it was over. That anger was over. But still, it was unresolved what was going to happen with us until the last day of his presidency, he called me into the White House. The, the, the White House was being dismantled already. Everybody else's offices were being changed. Nixon was coming in. Only the Oval Office was still straight because they wait until the last minute to take it away from the president. And as I walked in the door, in very grumpy fashion, he said, all right, part time. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, then, but then he said, and he just won me over this way. He just said, now, when you go back to Harvard, don't let those people poison your attitude toward me. And then he said, and remember, I don't have as much power as I did before. I won't, I won't forget what you're doing for me. So it turned out to be that extraordinary experience of spending much time between then and, and going down part time, but spending time at the ranch, really getting to know both Lady Bird and President Johnson. And I know Lucy is here tonight, Lucy Johnson. And she was my friend at that time. She will be my friend forever. And such an extraordinary thing happened because of Lucy. She called me up one day after Team of Rivals had come out. And she told me that her mother had been listening to it on audio. Lady Bird had already had a stroke. And she couldn't speak at that point. But she could listen to, to books on tape. And Lucy said to me, she wants you to know how much she liked the book. She loved the book. And I couldn't imagine what could happen. And then Lucy said, just wait a minute. 
And then in the distance, I heard Lady Bird clapping and clapping and clapping. So Aww. it was amazing. And then I called Lucy to make sure that I had it right. And Lucy, as all of you know, she's so much like her father. It's so amazing. So in very dramatic fashion, she said, oh, yes, I remember. She clapped louder and louder and more intensity. She wanted you to know you were part of our family again. So it meant everything to me to have that. It felt like I'd come full circle. Again, just being back here today in Austin, I've come full circle to where my whole career really began. So as we take a, a big step back, and, and I think, again, all of you have a chance, I hope, to read the book, to see the exhibit. You'll get more in-depth information to see all of these facets of the 1960s. Um, and, and you mentioned earlier that it, the decade ended in a horribly sad way for your husband. He, he was there. Um, obviously, Kennedy's body coming back to the White House. He was there with Robert Kennedy when he was k killed. Um, he was there at the 68 convention in Chicago when there were the horrible attacks on the protesters. And so it was, it was a sad end to what had been such a hopeful decade for him and I think for so many people. From your perspective, what lessons can we all learn from the 60s? I think the most important thing, and that's what we realized when we were going through the boxes, is that not to remember those sad moments only, but it was a decade that was powered by the conviction, especially that young people had, that they could make a difference. I mean, you know, the thousands of people that joined the Peace Corps, the tens of thousands who were part of the civil rights movement, collectively coming together, and they changed the face of the South. I mean, with the Civil Rights Act passed, that was the civil rights movement that had made that issue come to the forefront, and then it passed. And then voting rights changed things. And so many things were changed because of movements. That's what's happened in society always. And in a certain extent, there was the beginning of the women's movement in the 60s, the beginning of the gay rights movement. So I think what we have to remember, because we need it so badly right now, is that change doesn't always come just from the top down. When Lincoln was called a liberator, he said, don't call me that. It was the anti-slavery movement and the Union soldiers that did it all. It was the progressive movement that was already there at the turn of the 20th century in the settlement houses, in the cities, and in the social gospel and religion that helped Teddy Roosevelt calm some of the problems of the Industrial Revolution. And it was the civil rights movement, of course, in the 60s, and the women's movement, et cetera. So that I think that when we look at the 60s as a decade, we should remember that that was a time that we need to recreate now when people could feel that if they come together, they can make the things that they need to fix in the system. One of the things John Kennedy said, problems created by man can be solved by man. We have big problems in the political system now. We have a problem of too much money in politics. We have a problem of gerrymandering. We have a problem of, of, of maybe an electoral college. We have a lot of different problems. But they have an answer if we come together and figure out how to collectively work toward them. And I think we've got problems of gun safety. We've got problems of climate change. And all these problems are, 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 are solvable by man if we come together. And I think that's what the 60s can tell us. More than, any, more than the sadness of how so many things ended. What permeated the decade still lives on. We have to mobilize that spirit once again. So as America's historian in chief, as Don mentioned, one of the things that you do so wonderfully for us is you put what's going on today into a larger historical perspective. And so as we sit here tonight, in just a few weeks, we have what promises to be one of the most significant elections of our time. And I think it's only appropriate for me to ask you, how does the study of history help you through times like now, where it feels very difficult, it feels very hard? This is why history matters so much. It really can provide perspective. It can provide lessons. It can provide hope. And I'm heartbroken at the thought that so many schools are diminishing the study of history. It means that the young people living now through the anxious period we're going through now who haven't known anything other than polarized government, people yelling at one another, COVID, very difficult time. Unless they look at the other times that we've lived through, 
which were even more difficult than this time. They won't get the feeling and the perspective that we got through those other times somehow. I mean, just imagine what it was like for Abraham Lincoln when he took office. Seven states already seceded from the Union, a terrible war that would kill more than 600,000 people about to begin. He later said if he'd ever imagined what those first months would be like, he did not think he could have lived through it. And yes, a terrible price was paid in that war, but eventually we emerged as a far stronger country with emancipation secured and the union was restored. And the thing is, the people living at the time, they didn't know how it was gonna end. We know that that's the ending of that. They lived with the same anxiety we're living with now. They just went through it day by day. And similarly, at the beginning of the Great Depression, one out of four people out of work, no safety net in those days, starving people wandering the streets, a banking system that was under collapse. When Franklin Roosevelt came in, somebody said to him, um, you know, if your program works, then you will be one of the great presidents. If it doesn't, you'll be one of the worst. He said, no, I'll be the last. Democracy is at issue. Just as it was, Lincoln said in 1861 when he came in, that democracy was on trial then because if the southern states could secede from the Union simply because they had lost an election, then popular government would prove an absurdity. And then you think about the early days of World War II in 1940 when democracy was again in huge peril, as was Western civilization, when Germany was spreading its, its power and strength and its tanks across Western Europe. Tens of thousands died in the space of two weeks. Holland, Luxembourg, Belgium all had to surrender to Germany. France fell, leaving only Britain standing alone. America so wanted to help, FDR did, but we were only 18th in military power then. We'd let our military establishment deteriorate. We only became 17th when Holland surrendered, and we had only 500 fighter planes, and we had only um, more horses than tanks, and yet we mobilized even before Pearl Harbor. Business and government came together, and somehow they were able to start an assembly line of weapons that were used in Lend-Lease by our allies and all around the world. Then when Pearl Harbor came, isolationist ended, and we were able to, allies won that war, but they didn't know that either at that time. So I think what we've got to realize through history is that if you look back at history and you see that somehow the right person was there at that time, the citizens were active at that time, and America emerged str stronger than it had been before. And that's what's got to give us hope. We've got to think we'll get through this period now. It's not clear how it will happen, but eventually the strengths will come back. We should never, never not lose faith in what this country has been, and history gives us that faith. So let's just believe in the hope of history. Well, Doris, on that note, on that note of hope and comfort and inspiration, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for entrusting us with these incredible treasures and that really are the story of your life and of your husband's. And thank you for the full circle moment and thank you for being here with us tonight. Everyone, let's thank Doris one thank more time. Thank you very much. Thank you.